The pub is such an important fixture in British cultural life that it can provide a romantic getaway, a place to catch up with friends and a post-apocalyptic hideout in one location, as memorably portrayed in Shaun of the Dead. Yet pub names can often be as weird as they are wonderful, preserving snippets of local lore that become more obscure over time. From the moon underwater to Fanny's by gaslight or the fight in Cox of the Treacle Mine, strange pub names are almost an art form. Let's go and find out the folklore and legends behind some truly unusual pub names in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I do hope that you're enjoying the start of February and we are starting a whole brand new theme here on the podcast and I really do need to stop saying we because there is just me. But I like to think that I'm having a bit of a dialogue with you as well, so I suppose that's probably where the we comes from. Anyway, we're going to be moving on in quite a strange jump from Elizabeth Bathory last week to pub names this week. Because let's be honest, the pub is well entrenched in the cultural life of Britain as it is in many other places as well. And as a hub of social contact and often a provider of decent food, pubs offer a central meeting point for many groups of people. But how often do we actually think about pub names and what they tell us about local history, famous figures or half-forgotten stories? And indeed, my friends, pub names can actually be a treasure trove of the weird and wonderful aspects of local life that we may not even know, but usually love when we hear them. And basically, when I first started researching pubs and the folklore attached to them, which was actually a request from a listener, I did realise I was going to have to split the content across two posts because there's just so much to go through. So this week, I thought we would have a look at some of the weird legends attached to unusual pub names. And next week, we're going to have a look at some stories associated with a selection of pubs. Now, obviously, there are stories attached to these ones as well. But the ones next week, I'm going to try and kind of group them almost by type of story that's attached to them. Now, there are far more strange pub names than I can possibly include here. But I have tried to choose ones that had interesting stories attached to them. And quite a few of them were actually recommended by people on Twitter because I did my usual thing of saying, what's your favourite pub names? And people came back with some absolute corkers. So as I say, I can't pick all of them because then we'll be here for about a a month probably by the time I went through all of them. But we are going to go through some of the more interesting ones. Now, obviously, I do also need to point out that not all of the pubs attached to the names in this post still exist, because according to the British Beer and Pub Association, you could find 46,800 public houses in the UK in 2020, but that number is now lower thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on the hospitality industry. But the fact that the pub did exist still makes it worthy of study. So that is what we're going to have a look at in this week's episode. So the first thing I want to deal with is what the UK's most common pub names actually are. And you won't be surprised to hear that the Red Lion is the UK's most common pub name. And at the time of writing, 534 pubs held that name. The Crown comes in at number two with 488 pubs, followed by the Royal Oak with 413 the White Hart with 307 and the Plough with 286, all of which are actually relatively boring in terms of pub names compared to the ones that we're going to have a look at. Now, pub signs actually date to the Roman era and tavern owners apparently hung ivy branches outside to show that they sold alcohol. And then painted signs updated that practice in the 12th century. And then once literacy rates improved, pubs began adding names to their signs as well. So I have the fascination with the Red Lion. I want to get this one out of the way first because it is actually quite cool in and of itself. And Rory Smith notes that the figure is thought to come from John of Gaunt's coat of arms. And John of Gaunt was the younger brother of Edward the Black Prince and the father of Henry IV. And if you're interested in Edward the Black Prince, I've literally just covered him in last month's bonus episode of Fabulous Folklore that you can get if you become a Patreon supporter. But anyway, back to John of Gaunt. The Red Lion from his coat of arms then became popular during the reign of James VI of Scotland and First of England and he insisted that the Red Lion, which is actually part of Scotland's royal banner, be displayed on important buildings, which included pubs 
And there are actually a couple of stories of James I actually visiting pubs as well. So it seems like he was actually quite fond of them as buildings. So we're going to get into the more unusual pub names because I am aware that obviously time marches on. And we're going to start off with the Bucket of Blood, which is possibly my favourite. And you can find the Bucket of Blood in Hale in Cornwall. And there are two theories as to where this 18th century pub got its name. The first is that a local smuggler was murdered and his body was dumped in the pub's well. The landlord brought up what he thought was a bucket of water, only to find it was actually a bucket of blood. But there's also a theory that the corpse was actually the local revenue officer, not a smuggler. But either way, the landlord basically got more than he bargained for. Now, the second explanation is far more prosaic and, unfortunately, probably more likely. And that is it refers to the red water present in areas with high levels of tin mining. Either way, the sign depicts the rather horrified look on the landlord's face when he realises that the bucket does not have water in it. The next one was actually suggested by a few people on Twitter, and that's the case is altered. And the phrase itself comes from the legal profession, first used by lawyer Edmund Plowden to describe new evidence that suddenly impacts a case in progress. And Ben Johnson then took it up as a title for a comedy, and then it became a popular choice as a pub name. And there are a few pubs with that name, so I haven't sort of specified a particular one here. But each pub seems to have different reasons for using the name, and a common theory is actually that it was a way of saying that the landlord's situation had changed, often around licensing arrangements. Now, another theory includes a reference to soldiers returning from the Peninsula War who had stayed in a house on a hill or Casa Alta. And yet another explanation is that it's a variation on La Casa del Salta or the Dancing House. And again, this refers to soldiers and where they would have enjoyed themselves during the war. And I can't help thinking that both of those, it's unlikely that that would account for all of them. Whereas the idea of it being a a snide reference to the landlord's financial circumstances, shall we say, it seems a little bit more likely. Now, according to the pub in Bentley, Suffolk, there are actually two versions as to the choice of name. And in one, a landlady was rather flexible about payment for beer until she got married. And then all of a sudden the case was altered and her husband obviously expected people to actually pay for their drinks. And in the other, the pub actually stood down the road, but the landlord then took over a nearby house and altered it to create the current pub. And there have actually been evidence of alterations found in the pub, so that's why people think that that might explain the name. The next one, which again I got from Twitter, is the Britain's Protection. And you can find the Britain's Protection in Manchester on the corner of Great Bridgewater Street and Lower Moseley Street. And it opened in 1806 and it's a bit confusing because some of the articles I read said that its name came from the fact that people went there to avoid being recruited for the Napoleonic War. Whereas other people said that they went there and that was where a lot of the recruiters worked. So it was a bit difficult to kind of find out which one is likely to be. That said, there's an alternative explanation for the name and Eric Merriman has actually found links between the name and the 1819 Peterloo Massacre where soldiers stormed a peaceful protest and killed 15 people while injuring 400 others. Now, there is actually a wall mural inside the pub and an image of the protesters on the pub sign to commemorate the event, while a sign on the outside of the pub notes it was the only place to commemorate the protest, which did happen just outside. So Merriman suggests that the pub's name actually refers to a British protest for democracy and needing to protect that. So that's the other alternative. Then we're going to come on to The Headless Woman, which was another one that was suggested on Twitter. And this one stood in Duddon in Cheshire until 2014. And the name apparently refers to a local legend that dates to the 17th century. And as the story goes, a woman named Grace Trigg was a servant at nearby Hockenhall Hall. And the royalist owners had fled the hall, leaving Trigg behind, and parliamentarian soldiers found her hiding in a cellar. Now, the soldiers turned to torture to try and find out where the family had kept their valuables and Trigg didn't tell them. Either she just didn't know or she refused to let on. But either way, the soldiers beheaded her in the attic of the inn and then dumped her body in the nearby river. 250 years later, the inn's owners learned of the story and did some research of their own and they actually then apparently discovered the bloodstains in the attic. Now, people have reported seeing Trigg in the area, apparently carrying her head under her arm, sort of pacing back and forward between the pub and the river. 
Now, I said that it stood in Duddon until 2014 because it was demolished and there were actually campaigns to save the pub in 2013. Now, the developers claimed that the building had deteriorated to a point where it was no longer salvageable, but those wanting to protect it pointed out that it had been left to rot to make demolition the only choice. And I can well believe that because the current owners of the Cooperage in Newcastle upon Tyne appear to be doing the same thing, despite the fact it is the oldest medieval building in the city and should be protected. But there we go. Now, campaigners try to save the headless woman based on its historical significance, and it actually turns out that it could have been even more significant due to a particular visitor that it once had, Washington Irving. Now, Bobby Seale actually relates this part of the story on his blog, and it's absolutely fascinating because Irving apparently visited the pub while travelling between Birmingham and Chester, and the pub's name had caught his eye, so he asked where it came from. And the landlord told him the story, but then also added that seeing the headless woman was a bad omen. Irving stayed the night and actually insisted on sleeping in the attic because he was determined he wanted to see her. And while he didn't see the headless woman, he did claim that he'd actually heard someone sobbing in the night who sounded like a woman, and that he'd apparently found a patch of blood in the morning on the floor in the attic. So this snippet of English history actually prompted his interest in headless ghost tales, the most famous of which is the legend of Sleepy Hollow. So for that link alone, it's a pity that the pub wasn't saved. And to be honest with you, the Headless Woman isn't the only pub name that commemorates something bloody or gory or anything like that, because the three-legged mare in York does the same thing. And I say that because the name of the pub has nothing to do with horses, but actually refers to the gallows. Now, in York, they actually created their own Tyburn as one of four execution sites, and each site was under its own justice system, and the Tyburn site was the one that was essentially administered by the Crown from York Castle. Now, even though York Castle were administering justice, the gallows didn't actually stand there, and instead they chose a site at Knavesmire on the old city boundary beside the main road to London, so it meant that the first thing anyone saw when entering York was the gallows and whoever was hanging there. Now, the gallows at the site became known as the three-legged mare due to the fact it was triangular shape, and that basically meant that the state could execute three men at a time using that particular design. And yes, the Tyburn site in York did take its name from the London execution site, and the first execution took place on this particular site in York in 1379, with the last being in 1801. And the most famous execution here was undoubtedly that of Dick Turpin in 1739. But if you want to learn more about how many legends have been told about him, which just aren't true, then again, I have a bonus episode about that for people who become a supporter on Patreon. Now, the gallows are finally removed in 1812, but this pub still references the site that saw executions for over four centuries. And in typical English fashion, the pub is also known as the Wonky Donkey. Now, York isn't the only city with a pub related to public execution because Edinburgh's grass market boasts the last drop. And the area used to be where the gallows stood and the drop thus refers to a hanging and not the end of your drink. And Sir Walter Scott even refers to the dreadful spectacle of, and I quote, a huge black gallows tree towards the eastern end of the grass market, end quote. And even though he's writing that in a novel in the heart of Midlothian, you do get the sense that he's writing that as an actual person who's witnessed this particular site. Now, one legend claimed that the condemned actually had their last meal at that very pub and that the final whiskey gave the pub its name. But either way, it has become something of a tourist trap and obviously people like to go there because of its link with all things nasty. But I just find it quite interesting that you've got these sort of two pubs that commemorate methods of execution. Now, we're going to go from one extreme to the other for the legend of Oily Johnny's because this one, someone mentioned it and I just thought that is an absolutely fantastic name. But it's actually got a really, really uninteresting backstory. But I wanted to include it just because it shows how names can stick. Now, previous names of this particular pub included the Royal Oak and Oily Johnny's Inn. And basically what had happened was an earlier landlord called James Kirkpatrick. He used to sell paraffin oil from a shed beside the pub. And he then got the nickname Oily Johnny. And then the rest, as they say, is history. It's now pretty much just referred to as Oilies, which probably makes no sense if you don't know the story. But yeah, I just thought the legend of Oily Johnny's just sounded a little bit like a folk band. But the final pub that we're going to look at is a slightly different one because not all pubs have weird or strange names in a bid to remember local events because the John Snow on Broadwick Street in Soho actually preserves a slice of social and medical history. So in the mid-1800s, a water pump stood at the corner of Broad Street and Cambridge Street, which is now Broadwick and Lexington Streets respectively. 
But in 1854, a cholera epidemic broke out in London and Dr John Snow traced its origins to this particular pump and almost 500 cases could actually be traced to the pump and Snow ordered the pump handle to be removed. Now, while the pump was back in you six weeks later and there is some debate about whether removing the pump actually did anything to stem the outbreak or whether it was already waning, either way, the discovery did prompt the new understanding of cholera as a waterborne disease, which meant that they could start to do things about it. So it is actually a really, really important medical discovery. Now, in the 1870s, a pub was actually built nearby called the Newcastle upon Tyne, which like, I'm, I'm biased because obviously I live here, but it's a bit of a mouthful as far as pub names go. But it was also slightly fortuitous because Jon Snow had actually been an apprentice to a Newcastle-based surgeon in 1827. But in 1955, the Newcastle upon Tyne changed its name to the Jon Snow in honour of the legendary doctor and his work nearby. Although that is slightly ironic because Snow himself was teetotal. But there we go. It's still really cool that they've been able to preserve this really important slice of medical history in the name of a pub that people probably don't even stop to think about where it came from. But there are far more unusual pub names than I can include here. A few people mentioned the Moon Underwater in London. You've got Fanny's by Gaslight in Kilmarnock. And there were many other names suggested on Twitter. And many pubs across the British Isles do have names that stick in your mind. And in some cases, they preserve a quirk of local history or they're commemorating an event. And in doing so, they essentially become a unique record of things that might otherwise be forgotten until the story is then forgotten and all the remains is the name and everyone just kind of goes why but there we go and also like to be honest with you as far as pub names go the old 13th cheshire astley volunteer rifleman caught in is a far better choice than the plow any day of the week so i'm fascinated to know what are your favorite strange pub names please do feel free to tweet me and let me know because obviously i've collected a bit of a list there anyway you can instagram me or you can also comment on the blog post attached to this podcast episode below we are going to have a look as i say at strange tales associated with pubs because this month is all about the folklore of sort of specific buildings so i I wasn't planning on doing two weeks on pubs because it's ironic because i don't drink either but it there's so much attached to them because they're such an important part of a lot of communities so i do think it's actually worth looking at them so as i say watch out for next week's episode where we will be having a look at some stories attached to them and yes we are going to be having a look at haunted pubs as well because you kind of can't look at pubs and not look at ghost stories because the two of them go together really well and not just because they've both got spirits in them but i'm you see i can do rubbish jokes as well anyway feel free to let me know about any of your pub name ideas and that would be absolutely cool like i said a couple of times in the episode i've got like an absolute backlog of about 27 or 28 exclusive episodes now that you can get if you become a member of the fabulous folklore family on patreon i know it sounds like a cult but we're not i promise and you can get access to those at the three pound fifty a month tier and then if you just basically sign up you've then got access to like everything that i've posted up until this point at that tier so it's well worth digging in but otherwise i would love to see you back here next week so we can talk about weird pub stories so in the meantime have an absolutely marvelous week ahead and i will see you soon cheerio Well, thank you for listening and thanks for visiting Fabulous Folklore. I hope you enjoyed your stay. If you did, why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice? If you enjoy the show, why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well? And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next.